When Siegel and Schuster first sat down to make comic book history, they knew that the Man of Steel needed a personal life, with some extra drama as a hook. Thus came the tried and true idea of adding a love interest. But she couldn't be bland, this woman, whoever she wound up being, had to be both sultry and smart. A bundle of inspirations proved to be the perfect brew for Superman's love to be, fictional reporter Torchy Blaine, real reporter Nellie Bly, actress Lola Lane, and modeled after Joanne Carter, the future wife of Jerry Siegel. Put it all together, and you have Lois Lane. Today, we're talking about her history in comics, but before we get started, remember to leave a like on the video if you enjoy it, and if you like me and what I'm doing here, go ahead and subscribe. So, to the newbies, welcome, and to the oldies, welcome back. Let's talk about DC Comics. So, kicking things off with the original version of Miss Lane in Earth 2. She was raised by her father, a Marine Corps colonel, and grew up in a time that, well, didn't have a lot of female reporters. It was a struggle, obviously, but Lois was undaunted and was exceptionally gifted at her job at the Daily Star. One day, some new guy rolls in, named Clark Kent, who she thinks of as a real wet blanket, and suddenly her job gets even harder as the two become workplace competitors. Then, on one particularly fateful night, she's kidnapped. The first of... hold on, 31 times? Princess Peach has only been kidnapped 24 times, guys. Who knew she was a silver medalist? Anyway, kidnapped by some punk named Butch after a ball, Lois gets a big car shaken rescue from Superman and falls in love with him head over heels. Time carries on, with Clark competing for Lois's affection against, well, himself, before getting his brain all zappy by a guy named The Wizard. Watch the Superman video for more on that. And it gives him a newfound confidence that Lois is immediately attracted to. They get hitched, and shortly after, she pieces together that Clark is Superman. There had been times she suspected before, but when she goes to clip his hair and the blades practically explode, it's pretty damning. It's a big chat that follows. They still care deeply for one another, so they have a second wedding, Krypton style, to cement their love. The hands of time tick onwards, and eventually we hit the crisis on infinite Earths. It's going to come up frequently, so I'm just going to breeze by like it's commonplace. Lois, Clark, Superboy Prime, and Luther Jr. all play commentator to New Earth for a while, living in a super small pocket dimension, and eventually Lois passes beyond the mortal coil after contracting a disease literally designed just to get the plot in motion. She also comes back as a zombie afterwards, but let's not consider that a part of her life and shamble on over to the Lois Lane of Earth-1 instead. Earth-1, Lois, is about the most cookie-cutter you can get with a version of her character, which is to say she filled whatever role the writers wanted at any given time. This causes a bit of whiplash if you read her stories back to back. Sometimes she's loving, courageous, or intelligent, while other times she can be petty, cowardly, or dumber than a box of rocks. Her origins, if you could call it that, are also pretty simplified. She was raised on a farm in Iowa, similar to how Clark was in Kansas. Her dad wasn't military this time around, just a plain old farmer. This is, uh, to understate my feelings, a disappointment. It feels like they wanted to give Lois more in common with Clark, but entirely at the expense of her own character. In her youth, she entered a journalism contest and wound up going head-to-head -head against Clark. Lois comes out on top after reporting on some criminal biz and gets a verbal agreement from none other than Perry White that if she pursues journalism, he'll have a desk waiting for her. Then, in what I would be forward enough to call a strong disrespect to her concept as a feminist figure, she becomes little more than a rival to Lana Lang, essentially vying for Superman's affection like their Betty and Veronica. Either she's trying to expose his secret identity, or ogle him and trying to get him to slap a ring on her finger. Again, it really depended on the writer from issue to issue. 
Also, Superman's excuse for turning her down would flip between two explanations most often, either that their being together would endanger her life more than it already constantly does, or he just straight up assumes she won't be able to keep his secret identity under wraps. Not even as like a journalist, but more in the offensive women love to gossip sort of way. Comics at this point in time, well, they weren't exactly great when it came to writing women, sadly. Thankfully, as time marched forward into the 70s, Lois Lane got a bit more fleshed out and stopped being Superman's borderline stalker GF. She returned to being intelligent and self-reliant. This thankfully stuck with her once things got rebooted in the 80s. Stepping into New Earth's continuity, we get the recognizable version of Lois that we, and Superman, love. Her father, Sam Lane, was a military officer again, and an intense one at that. He raised Lois and her sister Lucy as if they were a part of his military outfit. Combat training, intensive exercise, the whole ball of wax. This gave her the impression growing up that every day was a battlefield unto itself, and she'd have to fight for what she wanted. So a lot of the time when Lois puts her foot down and fights for what she wants, the origins of that particular trait can be traced back to this upbringing. Lois found herself in Metropolis at 15, another city among many from countless moves around the country growing up. Having decided on the reporter career already, for some reason, she decides to snag some evidence of Lex Luthor's shady dealings and palm it off to Perry White at the Daily Planet. Despite her youth, Perry is just so darn impressed that he hires her anyways. She becomes the daring reporter we all recognize. Many years come and go, and the Daily Planet runs into some trouble financially. Prior to Superman's intervention, Lex Luthor had slowly gained a hold on Metropolis, every piece slowly falling under his thumb, with the exception of the Daily Planet, which was still committed to publishing the truth. Since capitalism do be capitalizing, Luther is able to effectively blacklist the business and is basically holding itself up by sheer willpower what little threads of that remain, at least. Since this doesn't apply to everyone inside the business, a few people jump ship, and Perry hires someone with little experience, Clark Kent. You can gather where things go from here. Lois decides to pay LexCorp another visit and starts poking around, eventually having to make an abrupt exit once she's sighted by security. But the exit is, uh, well, even more abrupt than she intended since she winds up falling off the roof. Superman arrives, catching Lois and saving her life. He plunks her down, flies off, and Lois sees the greatest reporting opportunity of her life. If she can catch him and nab an interview, it'll save the Daily Planet and rocket her into the Journalist Hall of Fame. The following day, Perry pulls Lois and Clark into his office and demands they parlay with LexCorp to find out more about the shady stuff Lois had spotted the day prior, and they do so. Then things get rocky. Lois goes to the interview only to discover that Luther is working with the military, specifically under the direction of her own father, Sam Lane. This is the first of many occasions wherein Lois's father proves himself to be more of an enemy than an ally. There are a handful of times in the future that Lois goes head to head against her father, and this is the first, a point where she realizes he isn't entirely moral. Since this is a superhero universe, the interview doesn't exactly run smoothly as the building gets attacked by Parasite, a higher end Superman baddie. Lois, given a front row seat to Kal-El's heroics, gets the opportunity she was waiting for and gets to jot up an article about this strange hero she dubs Superman. The Daily Planet publishes the story and it sells like hotcakes. The company is saved. Lois meets Jimmy Olsen and they become a reporting duo. Jimmy snaps the photos, Lois reports on them. If Lois is on the scene, Jimmy's there too, part of a package deal. Lois and Clark start dating, though their workplace rivalry still plays its part, along with Clark's half-baked excuses anytime he has to slip into his blue onesie and abandon Lois in the middle of whatever they've got going on at that particular moment. They become on again, off again for a while, and Lois even starts running through a similar repetition with Superman, 
unaware that he and Clark are one and the same. During a stretch of Lois being on again with Clark, he pops the question. Her mother, Eleanor, is cusping on death from illness, so she puts a pin in the question before circling back later when she's recovered, saying, yes. So now engaged, Clark feels it's only fair to disclose his superhero identity. They discuss it, and the biggest takeaway from Lois is that she's frustrated that Clark used his powers in secret to beat her to the punch with their articles all this time. So not a huge problem then. Now, I need to talk about something in the real world that impacted the next part of their story. Since they were now engaged, the writers for Superman and Action Comics fully intended to just work their way towards Lois and Clark's wedding storyline, but then a show was announced to be in production, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. The show was intended to balance the relationship between the two leads equally with Superman action scenes. To do that, they were going to build the relationship from scratch and have it evolve as the show progressed. Simple, right? Like, you might still be wondering what the relevance is here. Well, DC Editorial had a little panic at the idea that audiences might watch this show where their relationship was just starting out and then be confused picking up an issue of Superman and seeing the two of them married. Or maybe that the same hypothetical person might realize that since they're married in the comics, that will eventually happen in the show, thus reducing the viewer's excitement at any relationship drama in the show. It's a real lack of trust in the audience, if I'm being real. So, editorial comes down from on high and says, Nuh-uh. And they kill Superman instead. You've probably heard this story. Doomsday pops up, Superman and him have a big dust-up, and they both die. Lois, holding on to the Man of Steel's secret identity, has the disheartening task of reporting on Superman's death, trying not to just drop to the ground and let herself die from pure, uncut emotional tragedy. Lois's only respite after the whirlwind of multiple funerals, ceremonies, and news reports was that Martha and Jonathan Kent were just a phone call away. At least there were other people who understood her sorrow. About a month later in universe, and Superman is alive and kicking yet again, Lois tells Clark that she can't marry him, at least not anytime soon, because the idea of something like this happening again is simply unbearable. Which, fair enough, this feeling coupled with some extra emotional weight from some contrived love triangles and the like leads Lois to take a break away from Clark and become a foreign correspondent. Sometime after this, the Lois and Clark show announces in previews that a wedding is happening. So Lois in the comics realizes super quickly just how much she loves Clark, heads back to Metropolis, and their wedding is back on. Holy hell. But they get married, and even Sam Lane is there. She and Clark move into an apartment gifted to them by Batman, and they start their new lives together after a Hawaiian honeymoon. Then... A short while later, Lex Luthor finally gets his wish and buys out the Daily Planet. Like any time a company buys out a smaller organization, Luthor immediately lays off everybody who matters, except in his case he keeps Lois and Jimmy. Lois becomes a journalist stuck at a desk, only permitted to find stories online and re-upload them to Lex's website like it's the popular tab on Reddit. He even deactivates the elevator when she's in the office, so she can't just leave and do first-hand journalism. Hey, uh, Lex? That's illegal. That's called wrongful imprisonment. I get that you've done way worse stuff, but, like, this is such a small-scale slight that it honestly sticks out to me way more. Also, aren't there stairs? Take the stairs, Lois. But Lex gets tired of this after he's had his fun and strikes a deal with Elaine. He'll sell the Daily Planet on the agreement that Lois acts as a single story about him of his choosing later down the line. Lois agrees to the terms, and Lex sells the planet to Bruce Wayne for the whopping cost of one dollar. Then, a while later, Lex is president. He's doing some dodgy stuff, obviously, and Lois, through some in-depth sleuthing, comes to learn that he knew about an alien invasion well before it occurred and just didn't tell anybody because it furthered his own plans. 
Lex decides to cash in his chip, and Lois agrees that she won't publish the story, and then promptly hands the story off to Clark. Boom, gotcha! Comic book shenanigans abound for Lois, as they always have, until a weird juncture caused by the Convergence event. See, Lois and Clark got wrapped up in a bubble with Gotham City by a multiversal version of Brainiac and are put into a hodgepodge menagerie with other cities from across the multiverse. This whole thing takes place over the course of nearly a year, so in that time, Lois and Clark have a child, Jonathan. The multiverse gets restored, but the trio find themselves in a unique situation since, well, the universe has been rebooted by this point into Prime Earth. Lois carries on in semi-solitude, publishing articles under a code name while raising their child with her husband. Long story short, she and Clark get their histories combined with their Prime Earth counterparts after some further impishness from Mr. Mixopidilic. So let's talk about the latest version of the character. The Lois Lane of Prime Earth is more of the same up until she gets blended with her last iteration with a few tweaks. Starting off, she was the daughter of Eleanor and Sam Lane, and older sister to Lucy. Tiny change, Eleanor's ethnicity was described as Latino, meaning Lois comes from a mixed background rather than an entirely Caucasian one. She moved around a lot, as her former iteration did, but this time it's internationally, taking the family to places like Ecuador and Japan, meaning she's also multilingual as a result. After Lois' mother passed away from illness, much of the housework fell onto Lois' shoulders, including helping to raise her sister while she herself was still a child. Once she's out on her own, Lois gets settled into her career at the Daily Planet, working for Perry White, rubbing shoulders with Clark, and telling Jimmy where to point the camera. Superman pops up, she gets to report on it. You get it. She and Clark date later Mary, she learns he's Superman, etc, etc. Then the two versions of her get tossed into a cosmic blender, meaning their histories get conglomerated and she remembers both lives as one. The same applies to Clark as well, until DC's death metal event, where they also get the memories of their Earth 1 and 2 counterparts shuffled into their brains as well. You'd think that this would confuse and upset them as it would well, anyone else, but it seems that any time in the DC Universe something like this happens, it comes across as a really painless process. There isn't much to tell beyond this point, if I'm being frank. She raises their son alongside Clark, that son becomes Superboy, later the second Superman, and she continues to kick butt as a journalist known and respected worldwide. Clark goes public with his secret identity, which catapults that same fame even further. It's just a part of her life now. A life she's happy to be living. Lois Lane may have had a few rocky years back in the day, but now it's impossible to see her as anything less than an incredibly clever woman who knows how to kick some serious ass from behind her keyboard. She's Superman's one and only, a mother to the next great superhero, and a force of justice in her own right that shouldn't be reckoned with. And that's where we'll leave our story for now. If you really enjoyed the video, hopefully enough to have left a like and subscribed, you'll be happy to know that we also have a video available here on Superman's history in the main continuity. Thanks for sticking with us. I'll see you in the next one.